This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks. So good morning. So we are in uh, chapter 30. We're going to be finishing up uh, this chapter. And so we will uh, be talking about, uh, I'll, I'll just address again before there uh, mention that uh, during the lab session at 11.15, I will mention uh, regarding what's going on as far as uh, the test is concerned. And let me turn down my, sorry, folks. <laughs> All right, turn down my phone there, and uh, we will now begin with uh, chapter 30 here. So I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about, we ended the uh, the class last uh, last class there on Monday uh, regarding uh, sexual reproduction. So asex sexual and asexual reproduction present within uh, the kingdom fungi. And so what I want you to know is that really with sexual reproduction, understand that this is going on and this is taking place within the life cycle of the fungi in order to um, allow for genetic diversity and really triggered under uh, in stressful environmental conditions. Environmental conditions that are not um, the best conditions that will allow for then uh, the genetic diversity to take place as well as for the uh, uh, continuing on of the fungal species uh, and maybe looking elsewhere as far as sending out the spores elsewhere in order to uh, get to an environment that's more favorable and having better conditions, food uh, available, availability, that kind of a thing, okay? So I'm not going to ask you to give me this. I, I don't want you to memorize this is what I'm saying, okay? Just understand like what's the, the basis for what's taking place that many of the fungi do use both sexual and asexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction is then going to be able to allow for the species to then um, move on and uh, released via spores into the environment, okay? And then produce more uh, fungi. Whereas the sexual reproduction, that's going to be, again, producing more diversity within the species of the fungi. Okay, so that's what I want you to know from this. So please don't, don't memorize this. Okay, let's see here. Here I added this. So I've added some, some more uh, slides to our presentation. I'll post this. Uh, at the end of our uh, day today, as far as our sessions today, I'll post this newly uh, with the additions to the Chapter 30 PowerPoint. I'll post this uh, after our sessions today, okay? But what I wanted to do is I, I pulled this up because I, I wanted to show you and just remind you again how in the beginning of the chapter, we talked about how animals and fungi are more closely related than plants. And it's just by, as a result of, you'll see here, the most common uh, species here as far as that you're seeing uh, both the fungi and the plants and the and the animals sorry having a more common ancestor closer to than they do with the uh, plants are concerned okay so just wanted to show you that image there so understanding that fungi and animal having more uh, as far as evolutionary uh, theory is concerned having more common closer common ancestor, more closely related than, than plants would be, okay? So now this is you now getting into this image right here. So you're seeing with this uh, uh, slide here, we're still talking about evolution of the of kingdom fungi. So the analysis of RNA and DNA, so the, the genetic uh, um, information here, sequences indicate that fungi and animals are more closely related to each other uh, than they are to other uh, eukaryotes. And like, again, I mentioned to you regarding the plants, although you would look at a, a fungi and you'd say, hey, they look similar, but remember that fungi are heterotrophs, plants are autotrophs. So plants take uh, the sun's rays and they convert it into energy as far as via photosynthesis. Fungi do not do that, fungi are heterotrophs and they're really the major decomposers of the planet, okay? Um, both lineages are, arose from the opisticants, right? Single-celled flagellated uh, protists in the clade opisticanta. And so I'm gonna show you as far as one of the, in particular, one of the uh, phylum of the fungi have these uh, flagellated uh, cells present in the life cycle. Pretty interesting. You'll see here also that these findings uh, suggest that multicellular forms of animals and fungi evolved independently. And yes, they do because we look very uh, diverse as far as in structure and such, but just from a most common ancestor, fungi and animals have a more recent common ancestor than do the plants. And here, this is pretty hard to see, but you'll see here that within the uh, phyla of the fungi, you'll see the different types, and we're gonna be discussing these in more detail now 
for the rest of the chapter here. And again, too, when we, we look at these basidiomycota, right? These are the ones that when you think of a fungi, this is what you're thinking of. You're thinking of the mushroom. And this is only one portion of the actual fungi itself, the basidiomycota, it's the, the fruiting body. That's what you're actually seeing and that's what we'll, we'll eat and such. But really, primarily the organism would be deeper and, and in its quote unquote, it's mycelia in the mycelium within the, the root system of the hyphae. Remember those filaments that are present. So we'll discuss this and go over that. So you see here, fungi radiate into at least eight major lineages. Okay, we're gonna be focusing on like five or so in particular, uh, and then we'll look at a couple of additional groupings and such. Um, you'll see here that fungi diverged into diverse groups with different adaptations associated with the reproduction. And this is really one of the keys here as far as how they reproduce and what takes place in their reproductive stages that allows for this diversity, as well as their presentation and how they uh, also gather nutrients and such. So you'll see here as far as uh, you'll see these different types and we'll, we're going to be looking at uh, the parasitic uh, forms of fungi. Uh, we'll be looking at the mutualistic forms. We'll be talking about that also as far as um, this symbiotic relationship. Now, when you think of symbiosis, you think of more, and, um, and I want to just verify this and clarify this, that when you're thinking of a symbiotic relationship, think of a relationship where uh, two organisms are living together, right? Are working together, living together. Now, the types of parasitic, uh, mutualistic, commensalism, commensalistic, these are the, the variations that we'll look at in a moment here. But you're seeing then, okay, so we have the parasites and then we have these different types of um, fungi that we're gonna be discussing in more detail. Uh, the critids, the mycorrhizal, my, mycorrhizal uh, which are pretty interesting as far as their um, relationship with uh, in particular plants and how they have this um, relationship that is beneficial to both. And so we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail. So let's look on here. And we'll see here that, so the traditional phyla, the glomer, so what I want you to see here, this is pretty cool. And I did not create this, right? But think about this. You can think of the ABCs of fungi. So we have the ascomycota, the basidiomycota, the crit, crit, critidio uh, mycota, then we have the glomerulomycota and the zygomycota, right? So you can do A, B, C, G, and Z. And just that just helps you to kind of remember these uh, phyla. And you will have to know just from some very basics regarding uh, the differentiation between these types of uh, um, phyla of the fungi. Okay. Now, in addition here, you're seeing, and again, remember that you just saw here that we have the eight major lineages. And so we're gonna also be discussing the additional ones but these are the five traditional ones that we all learn and have learned for many years, and that there are changes being made as far as uh, phylogeny is concerned. Now, you'll see here as far as microsporidia, a group of single-celled parasites, uh, may yet make up another phylum. So in other words, yeah, there's a lot of um, change that's taking place as far as um, the nomenclature is concerned and how the phylogenetics of uh, fungi are concerned. So we're gonna be talking about these in more detail, okay? And again, monophyletic, uh, when you see here where it says zygomycota, uh, critidiomycota, probably not monophyletic, but glomerulo, uh, asco, and basidio, uh, monophyletic. Well, let's look here, and I just give this as a reminder regarding these terms and such, okay? So when we talk about monophyletic, we're talking about all the descendants of a common ancestor. So B is the com most recent common ancestor for D, E, G, and H, right? Monophyletic. Polyphyletic, right? You'll see here that they're coming from different uh, phyla here. And here you'll see as far as the uh, paraphyletic, it's not all the descendants are included in this because these would be also be the descendants. So this is only just one grouping, a section of the descendants of the phyla. So here we go with cryptomycota. And again, to coming back to that microsporidia, cryptomycota or hidden fungi, and we're gonna be talking about this and seeing this um, as far as in your lab uh, today there and over the next week or so, right? You'll see here, so cryptomycota or hidden fungi, uh, fungi included uh, single cell parasites. Initially it was believed that these fungi didn't produce chitin, right? And remember chitin, we mentioned that last class. We talked about how chitin is a uh, polysaccharide, it's a carbohydrate, complex carbohydrate. And so when you think of a chitin, you would think of 
like fish scales. You would think of like the shell of like a uh, the exoskeleton of a bug, of an insect, of a um, uh, spider, of a shrimp. Right? These would all be uh, these exoskeletons would be comprised of chitin. Okay, um, analogous to, similar to uh, keratin in humans. Okay, so keratin for our hair, uh, for our nails, right? Uh, filling up the cyto, replacing the cytoplasm of our cells on the outer layer of our skin. Um, keratin, analogous to chitin, very strong, uh, very important component of uh, the uh, cell wall now of fungi. Okay. Um, but uh, again, chitin important, but you're seeing here that with these uh, cryptomycota, these hidden fungi, I believe that these fungi didn't produce it, chitin, okay? Uh, microsporidia, again, single cell parasitic fungi, uh, and meaning that if it's a parasite, so let's look here for a moment, let's come back, let's go, I'm gonna move forward here. We go. Oh, sorry, folks, I had it posted, where did I put it? I'm trying to find a slide that I had, put in here that I wanted, oh, here we go. So I just skipped forward ahead because I want to just give you this so that this way you're you're thinking about this and we'll come back to this later on in the presentation, but I want to go to this and then we'll, we'll go back to where we were. So symbiotic relationships, organisms living together, okay? Parasitic, only one is benefiting. Mutualistic, both are benefiting. So when you think of symbiotic relationship, you think of Primarily, you're thinking of more of like a mutualistic relationship. Both are benefiting, okay? Parasitic, right? Only one is benefiting, okay? And it's uh, then in commensal, one's benefiting, and it's similar to mutualistic. One's benefiting, but the other, hmm, not really affected, good or bad, okay? So it's not really having any type of impact whatsoever. So remember those terms, please. And let's see. Sorry, folks, just getting back to. Okay, yeah, so here we go. So, this is interesting in that. So, this microsporidia, again, um, interesting that they lack. I thought that I turned down. Sorry, folks, let me. I'm understanding why. Okay. I thought I had <laughs> taken care of that. Sorry about that. So uh, lacking mitochondria, recall that mitochondria involved in uh, production of ATP, right? They also have their own mitochondrial DNA. Um, you'll see here, uh, they're, so they're they're unique is what we're trying to say here as far as uh, these cryptomycota, right? Here you're seeing a an example of a microsporidia and know that this is pretty cool stuff. So you see here this this coil, right? This coiled polar tube. I'm going to go to this next slide here. So structure of a microsporidia, right? So again, it's single cell, parasitic, okay? Spore germinates, its vacuole expands and forces the coiled, coiled uh, polar tube. That's what you're seeing here. Okay. Uh, outward and into the nearby soon to be host cell, the nucleus and the cytoplasm of the parasite enter the host through the tube pretty wild, right? So you'll see here, um, and then launching its developmental stages and steps and such in order to uh, be inside the host and have this, again, this parasitic relationship. Now the critids, right? The critids, uh, crito, uh, criti critidio uh, mycata, the only fungi that produce these motile spores, right? With the flagella, again, you'll see here, Yeah, here we go. Again, I showed you this on this slide here. We just started off the, the class today uh, showing you that um, the epistocants, right? These are the both lineages arose from the epistocants, single celled, flagellated, right? Flage fl flagellated protists in the clade epistoconta. Right? So, one more. Good. All right, so when we're looking at the critids, Again, they have these, during a stage of development, they have these flagella. Most are aquatic, and this would make sense because having the water for those, then that part of the stage of the, the spores to actually be able to move within 
uh, the water um, in order to go to another location for favorable, favorable conditions in order to then um, produce more of the fungi. Okay. You'll see here this Batrachocritrium uh, dendrobatis, right? Uh, wiping out, look at this, two thirds of the harlequin frogs. Uh, I'm gonna just show you here as far as, so you're seeing here that there is these stages taking place where um, this is an example of a critted and such. What I would like to show you would be, yeah, here's the frog. And in particular, it's the skin that's being, that is having this fungal infection, okay? I'm gonna go out of here for a moment and show you. Here we go. Frog uh, critted fungus, okay? So scientists think the decline and disappearance of some frog species in Australia and overseas may be partly due to a disease caused by critted fungus, okay? The fungus attacks parts of the frog skin. Now know that uh, respiration takes place through their skin, okay? So it's making difficulty for them to res respirate. Um, this will have issues with uh, oxygen, uh, uh, lower levels of oxygen, right? Anemia in these frogs, right? Uh, the fungus also damages the nervous system, affecting the frog's behavior. So look at, look at the behavior that can occur as a result of this skin fungal infection. Discolored skin, Sloughing or peeling on the outside layers of its skin can vary from obvious peeling of the skin, uh, particularly on the feet, to the roughness of the frog's skin that can that you can barely see. Uh, sit out, it'll sit out in the open, not protecting itself by hiding. This is the the behavior that can be affected, right? So it's not getting. It needs to be moist. It needs to be protected. It needs not to be sitting in the sun per se for too long, or it'll dry it out right, the skin, and that'll affect its ability for respiration. Can be sluggish and have no appetite, have its legs spread slightly away from itself rather than keeping them tucked close to the body. In more extreme cases, the frog's body will be rigid and its back legs will trail behind it. That's some pretty sad stuff for this uh, skin infection for these frogs, right? And so that's an example of this uh, critidiomycosis in frogs. And here we're looking at the harlequin frog, which is a pretty looking frog. Nice markings and such. Um, but yeah, again, leading to uh, many getting sick and dying. And some of those, uh, in, in some of those um, infections, right, uh, can be 100% mortality rate. I mean, it kills if they get, now it's not all, but certain um, aspect, certain types of um, the uh, infection can actually be 100% lethal for the frog. Now we go to the zygomycetes, right? The zygomites, mycetes, right? This is another uh, phylum of the uh, fungi. And you'll see here, so there are about 800 named species of these mercuromycetes. So zool, pagomycetes, and mercuromycetes, these are in the grouping of these zygo or zygomycetes, right? And so they reprodu reproduce via these uh, zygospores, hence they are within this subphyla of this uh, phylum of the fungi, okay? Some form mycorrhizae uh, with the plant roots or feed on plant detritus, right? And so I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about this in more detail and, and you'll see this even in lab, you're gonna be discussing this, okay, today. Um, you'll see here that part of these uh, species of the zygomycetes would be rhizopus, black bread mold, Okay, so if you've ever left, um, and this is gonna also be part of what we're gonna be doing today as far as our experimentation and such, you're gonna have a little bit of uh, an aspect of um, trying to produce uh, bread mold, okay? As far as your lab, in addition to uh, doing some other things today, okay? Um, reproduce sexually via these zygospores, and that's hence uh, the, the name or the nomenclature for the uh, uh, types of this phylum of fungi. And know that also um, the bread mold that's black, right? It's the charcoal colored sporangia which contain uh, the spores for the uh, reproductive purposes of the uh, rhizopus. That you, that's why it's giving that that black appearance. Um, let's see here. Yeah. So I want. So you can just see here as far as the the color of these um, spore. Uh, producing zygospores, right? They're dark in their color, and that's what's going to give off 
this and you're going to see here and looking under the microscope let's show you i yeah I do there you go so here you see that these are um the spores containing the spores right they're going to release the spores so if you were to look at this bread under a microscope and you would see under magnification you would see these sporangiospores which contain then these the zygospores which contain the spores that it will be released and allow for it then to spread for this uh rhizopus to spread and know that right that it's really that what's going on right here as far as in the base of and in the, the mycelium of this fungi, it's feeding upon the bread. Okay. Here's just another example, and you're seeing here this uh, pillow bolus spore dispersal. I'm going to read here. So the pillow bolus, right? It's another zygomycete. Um, contains the sporangium, that dark sac. This is what contains the spores that will be released and allow for then uh, to be sent to other areas within looking for food, uh, germination, and then uh, continually um, you know, spreading as far as the whole life cycle of the fungi to other food sources. Um, you'll see here that there are zygomycetes also that will reproduce asexually by spores. So you'll see that there's sexual and asexual reproduction uh, present in most and many fungi. Now here we have those uh, Mercuro mycetes. Again, this is in the phylum of the uh, zygomycetes, and you'll see here that they form mycorrhizae with 80 to 9 percent of all land plants. This is some cool stuff, folks. So look at right here. So the association with uh, fungi and plant roots, in particular, um, you'll see here that these mycorrhizal uh, associations supply the fungus with sugars with carbohydrates. From the plants from the plant root system and the the plants themselves then uh, receive right minerals uh, from the soil and, nu and nutrients and uh, water that allow for then these fungi to have this mutualistic uh, relationship so look at here uh, hypha uh, mycelium right so you see that's right here in yellow so here's the root system of this plant uh, increases active root surface area so really it increases the surface area for absorption of water nutrient acquisition up to 700 times because of this uh, mycelium network of this fungi in relationship with the uh, the root system of the plant pretty cool stuff asco uh, mycota right so this is again part of the a b c g and z right so the asco mycota makes up about approximately look at this 75 percent of the fungal species right so many of them are when you think of the ascomycetes think of that sac like structure containing the spores okay um interesting here and i thought this was pretty cool and you're going to see this on the next slide here um trapping behavior for taking nutrients from animals okay now it's very small as far as this little worm here and such this this uh, nematode right these nematodes so not animals but nematodes but still you know this is a creature that that has movement right well it can ensnare these small worms so take a look so this is an example of the sac fungi and again you'll see the sac present here there we go right here right and so this is the ascomycetes and then that's going to have the spores present within and now here is the um arthrobotrys right and so you're seeing here how and i'm this is a a, a worm right here right and you'll see the structure of this fungus is able to not only just have these loops present but these loops as a result of so let's read right here so the hyphae of this arthrobotrys uh, dactyloids dactyloides uh, trapping ascomycete, um, or ascomycete, uh, which form noose-like rings. When the fungus is stimulated by the presence of a prey organism, rapid changes in the ion concentrations draw water into the hypha by osmosis, right? So, and water, water will move from what? High concentration to low concentration. So that's what osmosis is. Uh, the increased turgor pressure shrinks the hole in the noose, captures this uh, nematode, this worm, the hypha then release digestive enzymes. Again, remember we talked about extracellular digestion is taking place for these fungi. So you, when you, you looked at, when you saw 
the bread mold here, right? So that mold has the mycelium network, right? That is attached to the bread and it's releasing enzymes, which will help to digest the bread and then allow for it to bring the nutrients into uh, the fungus. So pretty wild, right? How we're able to then, this fungus will release these uh, digestive enzymes and help to uh, digest the, the structure of this uh, worm. So the hypha then releases digestive enzymes that break down the worm's tissues. Okay. And again, we recall also that um, when we're talking about animals, we're talking about humans. We we looked at, uh, as far as in the beginning of the semester, how uh, humans have are made up of different tissues, right? So we're, we're thinking of connective tissue. We're thinking of muscle tissue. We're thinking of all these different types of tissues present, right? Um, uh, also epithelial tissue, right? Um, nervous tissue. These are different types of tissues comprised of cells and such. When we're thinking of fungi, no tissues present. We're thinking of, yes, there are cells present and there are structures present, but it's it's different than uh, within the animal kingdom. Yeast, okay? These are also uh, a form of ascomycetes, right? So yeast we're familiar with and we talked about uh, yeast uh, last class is regarding uh, for bread, baking of bread, and, uh, types of yeast products, as well as uh, uh, for production of um, alcoholic beverages and such. Uh, reproduce asexually by fission or budding. So if you have one via fission or budding, you'll have two identical from the one. After you have two identical, two two that are, are produced as far as uh, progeny, then as a result of fission, budding, you'll have four and four will become eight and eight will become 16, right? This is a form of uh, asexual reproduction. Uh, can reproduce sexually after fusion of two cells of different mating types. Right, so this again provides for the diversity present within uh, the yeast. Okay, in multicellular forms of these ascomycetes, uh, certain hyphae uh, are specialized for asexual reproduction, producing spores, these conidia, okay, um, containing haploid nucleus and some cytoplasm. And you'll see here that again, like I said, it's um, asexual and, and sexual cycles present within the life cycle of the fungi. Uh, again, I'm not asking you to to give me the details regarding it, other than to know that, again, sexual reproduction um, allows for diversity, genetic diversity within uh, the species, and then the actual asexual production will allow for then uh, the actual um, spores to be released and to reproduce out in the environment and produce more fungi present within the environment, okay? So you're seeing here that, Again, so the sexual reproduction, it's not producing spores that are going to actually go out into the environment. It's as a result of then the asexual reproduction that spores will go out into the environment and release and create new fungi uh, released into the air, released into the water, whatever it may be that's going to carry those spores to an area where they can germinate and produce new fungi. Now, uh, thinking of basidiomycetes, uh, let me get a drink here. Now, basidiomycetes, um, approximately 30,000 species, right? So quite a, a lot of species. And again, these are what you're thinking of when you think of a fungus, you're thinking of either uh, these basidiomycetes or you're thinking of um, uh, mold, like like uh, mold within a house, that kind of a thing. But primarily, you're thinking of Basidiomycota, okay? The Basidiomycetes. Um, Spore-producing cells are the Basidia. They're club-shaped, and then hence these can also be called uh, club mushrooms or club uh, fungi. Club monk fungi is the better term. Uh, some have enzymes for digesting cellulose, uh, like ligand. Uh, and are important decomposers of woody plant debris. So when you're out in the forest, so when we go out on a hike, right, and we're out in the woods and such, and um, as a kid, I spent a lot of time out in the woods, and even now we try to get out in the woods when we can, it's just fun. But when you're seeing these, whether they're, uh, oh golly, I'm, the ones that are, they would be present on uh, decomposing logs uh, in the, uh, on the ground, uh, in, in the, the leaves and such, um, they're taking care of, they're involved in recycling 
what's present as far as the, the debris of the plants and of the trees and such. Now look at this, some trap and consume bacteria and small animals by secreting paralyzing toxins or gluey substances that can immobilize prey. And then again, releasing, doing this uh, uh, extracellular, outside of the cell, extracellular digestion, uh, releasing of those enzymes. Recall again, enzymes are proteins, proteins involved in facilitating the breakdown of complex molecules into smaller molecules, and those smaller molecules then can be absorbed, okay? Mutualistic association with uh, with trees, again, mutualism, again, it's this uh, really this involved in this uh, relationship that is uh, positive for both, right? Healthy relationship for both. When you would think of symbiosis, that's the kind of thing. So look at how you can see all these different types of, the shelf fungus is what I was thinking of in particular on the logs and very common to see. And then uh, these different types of mushrooms. Again, this is the fruiting body of really a fungi that is, has a very deep and uh, spread out area as far as the mycelium and those uh, hyphae that are going to uh, reach out and uh, get the uh, nutrients from the soil and from the decomposing uh, structures that are present within that what we call like the substrate, right? So whether it's the leaves and any other decomposing matter and such that these mushrooms will um, take advantage of for nutrients. And you'll see here that fly, ag fly agaric, recall that we mentioned that last class there and how this is involved in, they would put it in milk or something as far as taking some of the, the mushroom, put it in the milk and it would uh, create like a sedative and actually can lead to uh, the flies being drawn to it and uh, drinking it and, uh, and actually, you know, drowning in the, the milk that's present within the, uh, this insecticide, so to speak. You see here, oyster mushrooms, all these are very familiar. The coral fungus, not as familiar. Uh, look at this, the white egg uh, bird's nest fungus and how these little quote unquote eggs will be released and the spores will, as the spores for that uh, type of fungus. Yeah, you're seeing here, yeah. And toxic to humans also that uh, Amanita uh, muscaria, right? Um, See here, I wanted to point. Yeah, here we go. So the one, the the white egg birds uh, nest fungus, Crucibillum uh, lave. Uh, each tiny egg contains spores. Raindrops splashing into the nest can cause eggs to be ejected, uh, thereby spreading spores into the surrounding environment. Pretty wild, right? You know, here you wouldn't think uh, something as quote unquote simple as a fungus, a fungi, and what we've been looking at here, but just the diversity. And also um, some pretty interesting things that you would never have think would be uh, possible for a fungus. Because really what you're thinking is, and for, from a non-scientific point of view, most people, they're thinking that fungi are related to plants and it's much different. Again, heterotrophs for fungi, uh, autotrophs for uh, plants and such. And here's just giving you a little bit more detail. Here are the gills of the cap of the mushroom, and this is going to, then the gills will contain structures here, and let's see, here we go. And so you see here these gills of the cap, and you have the basidia, okay? Again, basidio micata. And here these basidia contain areas for the basidium and the spores, and note that this cap here is, con is comprised of hyphae, right? So these hyphae are not only just present within the network down into the uh, substrate, into the uh, decomposing leaves and whatever it may be, the organic matter in the ground, but they also comprise the stalk and the cap. So you wouldn't think that, you would just think, oh, it's different structure. No, it's all the same structure, just it's all the same comprised of this hyphae and then these individualized um, areas here for, for the actual spore production and release of the spores. So if you were to take a mushroom and knock it, knock it on the cap. You and you did it over like a blank piece of paper. You could actually see the spores come out of that cap. Yeah, yeah. So this uh, basidia develop on gills on the underside of the cap. All right. And so here you're just seeing again the life cycle and what's taking place and how that those spores will then. Uh, be released into the environment and germinate and 
produce more fungi. Conidial uh, fungi, right? So when a sexual phase is absent and has not been yet detected, they're called conidial, or also another term is imperfect fungi. And you're going to see that in the lab as far as the, they're going to, there's going to be some discussion regarding uh, these imperfect fungi. Again, they haven't seen or, or been observed and, and determined that there's a sexual phase. So they'll put them in that grouping of the conidial, aka imperfect fungi. But when there is a relationship, so when researchers discover a sexual phase, if they do, for conidial fungus, then, uh, or when molecular studies establish a clear relationship to a sexual species, then they'll be reassigned to an appropriate phylum. Right? But this is the one for those that are uh, not having a sexual uh, phase present. Lichens and uh, mycorrhizae. So we, we've already kind of, we've talked about the mycorrhizae. First, we'll talk about the lichen and then we'll talk about the mycorrhizae in a little bit more detail. Um, but you'll see here, so fungi form uh, mutually beneficial associations, okay, with plants and other photosynthesizers, insects and even mammals, okay. These associations play major roles in the functioning of the ecosystems that they all are living within. Now, a symbiosis, symbiosis this, uh, mute, this living together, right, state can be either parasit parasitism or mutualism, in a parasitic state, again, one benefits, the other does not. It's negative effect. Um, mutualism, um, the two all you know, benefit each other by their relationship. And again, I mentioned this to you as far as parasitic, mutualistic, and commensal, where one benefits the other, nothing really, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. But in parasitic, you know, if we have, as a human, if we have a parasite present within, you know, whether it's a, a worm, whether it's a from malaria, whatever it may be, this can be harmful to, to the human, not harmful to the parasite, right? They're living off us. But let's get back to uh, lichen here. And we're gonna see how uh, single vegetative body that is a result of, so in other words, like a lichen is like a combination of a fungus and a photosynthetic partner and a plant. It's pretty cool, right? So lichen isn't just one, cre it's, it's a combination of, the fungus and the plant coming together and having this uh, mutualistic relationship. Thousands of ascomycetes and few basidomycetes form this kind of symbiotic relationship. The fungal partner, right, usually only about 10% of the, the structure, and then 90% would be the photosynthetic partner. So you should know these terms, mycobiome, right, this is just the lichen, uh, the fungal partner, and then the photobiome would be the um, plant component of this uh, lichen. And so we're looking at uh, green algae, uh, cyanobacteria. These would be what be the 90% and then the 10% again would be the fungus comprising a lichen, okay? This mutualistic relationship. Here you're just seeing examples of lichen. Now see here that uh, lichens secrete acid that break down rock converting it to soil that can support larger plants. It's pretty cool stuff, right? I don't know if you knew that. Um, it's pretty neat. You'll see here also lichen are food for insects, some invertebrates, uh, reindeer and musk oxen, and the Arctic tundra. So lichen do play an important role in the ecosystem, okay? Um, and another thing there that I thought was quite interesting and I didn't know about, I didn't recall, uh, environmental chemists monitor air pollution by observing lichens, most of which cannot grow in heavily polluted air. Right? So that's quite interesting and really uh, very important for us uh, living in our, in our fellow um, creatures that we live with and organisms that we live with and share this environment with, realizing that uh, air pollution and how it can affect uh, lichen growth. That's pretty cool. So let me let me see here as far as if there's there's yeah okay <laughs> this is interesting it's called old man's beard <laughs> a hanging lichen that's pretty cool all right and okay okay the mycorrhizae so now the mycorrhizae right or mycorrhiza um, we're looking at this again a mutual mutualistic relationship this symbiotic relationship this they're they're benefiting both are benefiting with the fungi fungal hyphae 
you know, the 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 uh, mycelium, right? That that network of the hyphae present in the soil and roots, right? So fungus and a plant working together, living together, having this mutualistic relationship, enhancing the plant's ability to extract various nutrients from the soil. That's pretty cool stuff. Now you'll see here, look at that, right? So primarily the root system, not so big of this pine seedling, right? But really this would be then the fungus that provides a much more expanded um, aspect of the ability to reach out into the soil for nutrients and such and to share with this plant. And there's there's been some research, which I find very interesting, that um, depending upon um, the give and the take and what's being offered to the plant or from the plant to the roots, um, there can be a kind of a, a more of a or an interesting and complex relationship in that depending upon how much one is giving to the other can depend upon what's given back. So in other words, if the plant doesn't seem to be receiving enough nutrients, it can hold back what it's giving to the fungus until there's more being given back from the fungus to the plant quite complex relationships not just a simple okay yeah we just give i give you this you give me that but depending upon how much and what is given can really depend upon and there's been studies done to to show um, this more complex relationship between the fungus the fungi and the uh, plant life and system the root system in particular quite interesting Let's see here. So when we see here, uh, as far as uh, in the ecosystem society, so sapro, sap, sapro, saprobic or saprobes, saprobes, these are the types of fungi that actually then um, live, you know, within a, an environment where they're actually uh, sending out their hyphae into the mycelium, which all coming together, that mycelium network into the ground and receiving, feeding on dead organisms, right? So saprobe, saprobic, or saprobes are not parasites. That's what I wanted to get about. So knowing that term, saprobic, saprobes, they're feeding on dead organisms, on organic waste, recycling carbon, locked in organic tissues. Mycorrhizal associations make an essential contribution to the nutrition of most terrestrial plants. And really, they, they, they do so much better, the plants, with this relationship than without this relationship between them and the fungus and the fungi. Here's two terms that you'll need to know, and you'll need to know them for lab, and you'll need to uh, do a little bit more research on them, and that's ectomycorrhizae and endomycorrhizae. And so what's the difference? Well, endo, when we think of endo, we think of going inside, right? So endocytosis, a form, so like phagocytosis, cell eating, we're bringing material into the cell. Endomycorrhiza, so there's no sheath that's being produced. You'll see that the sheath will be produced for ecto but the fungi are present in the cells, endo, they're, they're entering into the cell. Ectomycorrhizae, right? Again, these have to do with the relationships between fungi and plant roots, okay? The ectomycorrhizae produce a fungal sheath around the root, the hyphae penetrate between the cell walls of the roots, uh, cortex, but not into the roots themselves. So it's a little bit of a different relationship where the endomycorrhizae, think endocytosis, think, think entering into the cell. So they're present within the cell itself, okay? So endophytic um, fungi, mutualistic relationships, you'll see here, live within leaves or other plant tissues, right? And again, appear to be mutualistic, okay? So both are benefiting from this relationship, okay? Then here you see an example of this as far as on this uh, grass. Now, lastly, as far as for lecture and for this chapter, I'm just going to take a moment here and just do a couple of uh, slides regarding uh, parasites, right? Uh, pathogenic type of fungi, okay? And uh, you'll see here parasitic fungi attack a wide range of hosts, including plants, animals, and other fungi. Uh, you'll see here V. inequalis, v. inequalis causes apple scab disease, and so this can uh, create issues with um, plants and such. You'll see here the other one here, and Spherotheca panosa, uh, powdery mildew, Candida albicans. I'm going to discuss this a little bit here as far as producing infection of the mouth 
the vagina. These are moist areas, warm areas, um, when conditions allow it to overgrow. Let's move here before we talk about the other two. And you'll see here with the Candida albicans, it's commensal, meaning that um, it can become uh, pathogenic in immune compromised individuals. So commensal, meaning that it can, it's present within uh, the uh, flora, the microbiome of the human of humans. Okay, and it's not causing any type of uh, problem unless someone can become immune compromised. Uh, their immune system is weakened. They have another type of infection going on, uh, HIV, whatever it may be. And they can then develop this overgrowth of this uh, fungus. And you'll see here, a uh, common etiology cause of uh, nosocomial infections. Nosocomial infections are those infections that are we would consider hospital acquired, okay? Um, can be uh, candidiasis, okay, candida. Um, most common fungal UTI infection uh, can be asymptomatic, candida. Uh, vaginal infections, burning, itching, swelling, discharge, rash, uh, thrush or oral thrush, you might hear it called, in the oral cavity, again, moist environment, warm environment, um, white spots, burning, pain, cotton-like feeling inside the mouth, right? These are all as a result of a candida type infection. Okay, and then here just a few more that are mentioned here, and and know that, folks. Really, you'll see here that as far as how um, infections can cause, um, you'll see here with uh, claviceps purpura, um, affecting the digestive tract, infecting the nervous system, right? Convulsions, even death, right? That's some pretty serious stuff as far as symptoms from a fungal infection. Um, Aspergillus uh, can cause cancer when ingested over time, right? This could be extended periods of time. Um, there's research is being done on that. Uh, respiratory tract issues, but most strains can be harmless. Uh, but again, it's, you know, depending upon the patient and the person's uh, immune system and how it's functioning. All right. I think, yes, we did that. And last class there, we talked about uh, the beneficial organisms and such, and I'm not going to go over that any longer. So that's it for today for as far as the um, PowerPoint is concerned, okay? So again, I don't want you to, as I'm going back here a bit, so I do not want you to, as you're focusing on studying for this chapter, <coughs> excuse me, looking at the life cycles and just memorizing components and such, that I do, do not want you to do. Focus on what I've uh, underlined and highlighted and such, and what I've discussed as far as here in uh, lecture, focus on that, please. All right, I'm gonna stop recording.